Hi there, welcome to Health Econ. I am Dr. Christy Gonder, Professor Christy, your course faculty. I want to take the opportunity to provide a short overview of economics, what I refer to as a snapshot of Econ 101, and then introduce healthcare economics, policy embedded. These short lecture presentations are intended to help guide you with the assigned readings and other supplemental materials posted to the learning modules. I use several different resources to guide my lectures, but you're not expected to get them. I do, however, encourage you throughout the semester to access credible empirical, that is evidence-supported resources to help substantiate your answers and opinions on the various issues. This is not a nursing course per se. It is required to take but the course is intended for any health professions major. We have nursing, radiology, and health services administration students here. Therefore, I craft the course to meet all of you. I have an undergraduate degree in health services administration, and I gotta say, really opened my eyes as a nurse. I hope to do the same for each of you. Okay, let's get right into it. We will begin with common abbreviations used. See each listed here. Moving on, let's define. What is economics? It is the study of the production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services. Additionally, it is the study of how resources are allocated scarce resources. There is never an endless supply of anything. Like subspecialties, there too are major bodies of study in economics. Macro and microeconomics are examples. These areas of study are just as the prefix conveys. Macro is big. It is the study of larger segments of the economy, such as inflation and unemployment rates. Microeconomics is more small scale. This refers to areas like personal and individual economic factors. For example, a household or small business budget. With the macro aspect, it is the big picture of the country's economic system. Common terms are introduced in this class so that you can understand what the media and economists are referring to when they make statements like, we are in a bull market, or we are facing a slow GDP, anemic growth. Personally, I get a kick out of seeing medical terms used in other industries. It makes it fun to learn. You could certainly apply what anemic means in nursing to the economy. Do you suspect that infers we are well oxygenated and productive? Well, so, America is a free market or capitalist system. Although not entirely free, it is a system by which supply and demand determine the workings of the market rather than a government authority. This is dwindling, but still stands for the moment. Can you think of a few areas where the government does play a primary role? There is the EPA, OSHA, these governing bodies exist to protect the population, but exchanges occur freely among individuals. As we discuss healthcare models, and toward the end of the class, healthcare reform, it's good here in the beginning to compare capitalism to socialism and communism. Socialism exists when the government or bureaucracy controls industries, yet the exchange of goods and services still occurs within the market. Communism is total government control of the means of production. Both models infer equality for all, a common ownership. So what is healthcare economics? Applying the above definition, simply add understand the issues that underlie health and health care. These terms are often used interchangeably, 
yet are not synonymous. There is a difference between health, H, and health care, HC. Can you think of where I'm going with this? Whether someone is in good or ill health, it does not mean he or she lacks access, access to health care, such as emergency services, urgent care, and providers. There is so much more to understanding health economics. We will see that there are an array of concepts, theories, and topics that underlie the decisions we make about healthcare. That's what makes healthcare different from other goods and services. Let's define health. Can you think of a definition? Likely not. And if so, it is subjective, meaning what is deemed good health to you may not be to the next person. What determines health? We can only measure the outcomes and consequences, but it lacks a universal definition. Health varies between services, time, and demographics. Is health a right? Yes. This is precisely why we have laws protecting human life and thus health. Clean water, safe handling of food products, safe roads, etc. Now, is health care a right? From an economic stance, the answer is no. People are not entitled to a service or cares that they cannot pay for. Now, there exist subsidies and charities to help assume costs because yes, healthcare is expensive. As a generalization, Americans do not let people die because they can't afford it. This is particularly seen in emergency centers. Patients are stabilized for life-saving measures regardless of, quote, ability to pay. We'll see key terms here in a minute, but price must be addressed while we were on the topic of health. To gain and maintain what each of us deems as good health, we typically demand it regardless of what it costs. Health is considered fairly price inelastic. Henderson, the textbook author, describes price elasticity of health as the following. The elasticity of healthcare ranges between 0.5 to 0.15. This tells us that for every 10% increase in healthcare, we only see approximately a 1% increase in health. Why not an equal match of say 10% for 10%? Because recall, health is subjective. People do what they want and live their lives accordingly, despite all the resources and money we put into telling them otherwise. Take for example, we all have seen this. The patient or family member who struggles with say elevated blood sugars or frequent episodes of bronchitis, but he, she absolutely refuses to change their diet or quit smoking. Education tells them otherwise. Doctors, nurses, everyone repeatedly advises in favor of healthy eating options and smoking cessation, but no. This illustrates how health care has a trivial effect on health overall. Isn't this interesting? This is a great class. So now let's look at what makes health care different. In a typical market, the buyer knows what he or she wants. It is planned, known, and tangible. I can walk into Home Depot to buy paint. I have control because I am the buyer with the purchasing power. I have a lot of options to choose from and I likely know what it is that I want. If Home Depot doesn't have it or I feel that I'm not receiving good customer service, I can simply leave. I have the freedom, the choice, to go down the road to a different Home Depot or even a different store for that matter. Say their competitor, Lowe's, or there is Ace Hardware, Sherwin-Williams, you get it. Consumers and competition are central to the free market. Now, the market for healthcare is a bit different. 
the relationship between buyer and seller is asymmetrical because here the seller, the provider, knows more than the buyer, the consumer, or patient. The service sought is typically not predictable and really is not desired. Who wants to go to the doctor's office or hospital? Or to be told you need to go in for surgery? Definitely not the same as buying paint. Moreover, healthcare varies from person to person and it is random. That kind of goes with unpredictable. An MI, heart attack, can happen at say 3 a.m. on a Sunday instead of between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. on a weekday. Likewise, a car accident that requires an emergent CAT scan, unlike the paint where I come home after shopping at Home Depot, what do I see following the MI or the CT scan? Healthcare is essentially intangible. Additional differences include A, there is an insurable risk associated, meaning there is almost always exists a third party payer, insurance, and B, the government can intervene. As we will discuss more in depth moving forward, society views healthcare as a right. Thus, the government can and does step in. Here are 10 key economic concepts. Each are detailed in the textbook. These concepts are applied throughout the course and really to just about any economic issue. Be familiar with each. I recommend briefly defining and then memorizing all 10 because of the centrality of their application. I colored supply and demand because we're going to look at how supply and demand work with P or price. I grabbed a couple of graphs from Google Images because visuals really help translate, translate the information. There's a lot of information in various tutorials available that explain the law of supply and demand, but I like how these demonstrate the concept. Supply represents how much the market can offer. The Q or quantity supplied refers to the amount of a certain good producers are willing to make available when receiving a certain price. Price here is the incentive. Therefore, there is a positive or linear relationship, recall these terms from statistics, between the amount of a commodity a producer will provide and the benefit from making it available. Conversely, demand shares an inverse or negative relationship between the amount of a commodity that a person will buy and the sacrifice needed to have it. The quantity demanded is essentially what the person is willing to buy at a certain price. I use the term price inelastic when talking about health. Price can be elastic or inelastic, which is the sensitivity of consumption to price. The supply relationship slopes upward because the higher the price, the higher the quantity producers will supply at a higher price because selling a higher quantity at a higher price increases profit or revenue. But as mentioned, the demand relationship slopes downward. People naturally avoid buying a product that will force them to forego the consumption of something else they want. Applying a key concept, what is their opportunity cost? That is the alternative. This is the negative or inverse relationship. If inverse, as one goes up, the other goes down, the opposite direction. Alternatively, a linear relationship says as one goes up or down, so does the other, same direction. Supply and demand are different for the consumer than the producer. Okay. Elasticity, I want to explain that more. Picture a rubber band. Those of you nurses, I'm not referring to Frank Starling's law to describe cardiac preload, myocardial fiber stretch, ha. Back to econ, the rubber band. Does it bend, snap easily, elastic? 
or does it remain pretty rigid, doesn't change much, inelastic? Healthcare is fairly inelastic, little change in demand because it is so valued and necessary. People will buy despite price. Question to look up, food for thought. The price that society places on human life is inelastic, but is it what economists call perfectly inelastic? Remind me and I will answer that question on the general chat forum. For other goods and services, say I want a new dress from Nordstrom's or, oh, Dillard's. This dress is price elastic. That is, the price affects demand, a flexible rubber band. Consider why this is compared to a healthcare product or service. One, I can live without the dress. It is a want versus a need. And two, I can get the same dress, if not very similar, that costs much less at another store. Heck, even online, bypass the department store entirely. Use good old Amazon. As we move along, I will often ask you to think about price and demand. How does price affect or impact demand? In healthcare, there are a few non-economic factors influencing demand. A, the need. An example is the need for, say, EMS versus a routine office visit. B, taste or preference. An example here can be inpatient versus outpatient surgery. And C, quality of life. Hint, consider quality of life when asking yourself about the inelasticity of life as perfectly inelastic. There are additional factors listed here that you can review further. Healthcare spending. The U.S. is often criticized for its cost and the amount used. Yet many argue our health outcomes are not better compared to other industrialized nations. Like everything else, there are reasons for this. For one, our quote, rich lifestyle has created a huge increase in rates of obesity, type two diabetes, cancers, and heart disease, to name a few. On page 79 in the textbook, there is a nice illustration of that titled, Does Obesity Increase Medical Care Spending? Let's look at a few important statistics underlying health and healthcare. First, as the statement infers, the more people, the more healthcare is needed, right? Each of us has healthcare needs. So naturally, utility goes up. GDP is gross domestic product. GDP refers to the monetary value of goods and services produced in the country. Healthcare is important to use. As soon as society collectively determines what is important, funds are allocated accordingly. People believe all have a right to healthcare and we want the greatest and latest, i.e. technology, and we definitely use it. A big factor here is the lack of direct payment. Recall, healthcare has an insurable risk. Unlike the exchange of other goods and services, we typically do not pay for it. We don't walk in the door and see what the sticker price is and have to come up with that amount. Now, there are exceptions such as those uninsured, private pay, and of course, discretionary procedures we pay out of pocket, like cosmetic surgery. But in general, most of us have some form of health insurance. We simply face per service copay and annual deductibles. So what does this do to behavior? Picture a $30 copay to see a provider versus say a $250 fee. Of course, we'll use more of it if it costs us $20 to see the doctor. We are starting to see such a thing, though, in the medical market where offices post their fees and do not accept insurance due to the complexities and reduced reimbursement rates of insurance and other bureaucratic mandates emanating from the ACA, Affordable Care Act. We'll look at the ACA in the next couple of slides kind of like the nurse's five rights of medic medication administration, ask yourself 
the three rights of health care. Are we, the U.S., providing the right treatment in the right place at the right time? The ACA was advocated to control costs by implementing mandates to rein in spending. The 2400-page Act had five goals, as you can see listed here. I pose a question. Did the ACA, also known as Obamacare, eliminate health care disparities? Like equity, disparity is difficult to qualify. Perhaps quantify to some degree, but not qualify because people are people. Recall, we do what we want. You really can't control human behavior. You really can't in a free market. But this executive action moved the healthcare industry towards a single payer or socialized structure by mandating all insure by offering public plans. Did all insure? And even if you answer yes, do all have access to quality healthcare? In other words, were we all offered Cadillac or what I call BMW health insurance? There are six provisions to the ACA. The third one listed is funding to the individual mandate. If there is no proof of insurance, you could be fined. That has since changed to the executive orders as have other parts of the bill. The original penalty, penalty was a fine, but it was not a criminal offense. One's tax return would be withheld. But if you were one who did not see a tax return, then there was no way to collect the money or fine. Interesting. Since that time, President Donald Trump, 2020, removed the individual mandate. And in many ways, this began to dismantle the ACA because if we no longer have, because we no longer have to insure, there is no guaranteed funding stream to keep the program afloat. We will be watching this closely because it seems almost every week there is something new on the political front regarding healthcare. In Canvas, I posted links to what I call hot off the URL, what years ago would have been hot off the press when we had only newspapers as our news source. I intentionally posted left-leaning and right-leaning news organizations so that you could compare using economics to generate an informed decision rather than letting the news inform public opinion. The next slide shows the anticipated taxes from, at that time, the CBOs, Congressional Budget Office's projections by 2022. Again, due to changes, these numbers are not accurate. Nonetheless, still a good representation of what this costs Americans. Case in point, I share a personal story. In 2012, I needed a new heart valve, an artificial percutaneous tissue valve that had been approved by the FDA just a couple of years earlier, although still considered experimental. But one of the new taxes to the ACA brought us was taxing medical devices, which would kick in as of January 2013. Things like implanted pacemakers, artificial limbs, etc. I knew this because, you know, I'm an astute healthcare consumer and, of course, a nurse. So I planned my procedure for December 2012, finals week. I knew I was already going to pay a larger percentage of out-of-pocket costs because the approval was pretty new, but that tax would make it even more. The heart valve is a medical device placed in the cath lab, just like you'd place a stent. What an advancement. Go home the next day instead of facing days in the hospital for open heart surgery. Now, consider the implications of these taxes. Not only did that cost trickle down to me, the individual patient, but what do you suppose it does to the medical device industry? What does an added tax do? It stifles innovation. ACA taxes. Economist Thomas Sowell has a nine-part nine series on health care, medical care spending in the U.S. I placed it on Canvas because I think he does a nice job detailing, yet presenting in a way that is easy to understand. 
I once listened to a financial advisor who said she was going to present the Big Bird and Elmo version to simplify for the audience. I like that. I could admit when I need something explained in simple terms, nothing wrong with that. But you have to admit that's funny. Consider the implications of costs, spending, and utility. The book goes into detail about economic welfare. See common definitions and graphs to illustrate this concept. I usually do not expect memorization of statistics, rather what the statistics show, what they mean. For example, the majority of spending occurs blank. If I do want you to know a specific number, I will clearly state that. There are, there are free market approaches to cost control. This slide lists some common remedies. Tort reform refers to high cost litigation. When I say restrain m and M, I am referring to Medicare and Medicaid. HSAs are health savings accounts, also known as MSAs, medical savings accounts. By the way, I do not expect you to know at great length each of these strategies. These are simply introduced in the beginning to then build upon and address in the respective weeks. I placed at the bottom of the slide two celebrated quotes that I think capture the essence of what it means to improve and make available health care for all. It is that desire behind every invention and the ingenuity to create, to produce, that benefits all of society, which segues nicely to the last slide. Americans love to create in a way. We have had a bit of an we have a bit of an enterprising spirit, and we are giving people, and we are giving people. Who responds in a global crisis? America. We as a nation kick into gear to offer our best and brightest minds and talents to help. Apply these factors listed here to health and to healthcare. Ends the first lecture presentation. Section two of this class covers evaluation measures and the demand side of healthcare, demand for health insurance, and what those structures look like and how they work. Thank you. Bye now.